Find out just what any people will quietly submit to, and you have found the exact measure of injustice and wrong which will be imposed upon them, and these will continue till they are resisted with either words or blows or with both. Frederick Douglass, about abolitionist orator, writer, and statesman. <laughs> All right. Good morning. Welcome to another episode of the Liberty Dad podcast, a discussion on politics and culture. If you're tuning in live, especially thank you for giving me your time so early. Colorado, you have a problem. We're going to go through a bill today and we're going to talk exactly why this bill is a problem. Good morning, Mr. Producer. My producer has arrived, so I need to be on my best behavior. All right, so what do we got going on today? Well, I saw something on Twitter, and I was like, hmm, and I just took a look, and I was like, oh, a bill review. I need to review this bill, and it's only eight pages, so it wasn't very difficult to do because if you were listening yesterday, you know that I said, hey, I'm probably going to be doing some, you know, uh, this week, I will probably be focusing on a lot of just um, where I do the musings, like the, the dad musings, where I just kind of pick different things and I just talk a few minutes about each one of them rather than preparing on one major topic. And the reason for that is, again, it just can be difficult to fit everything in with the amount of time that I have. So I was initially going to do that and then I saw this bill and I just, I just couldn't resist because I was like, I, I got to do this bill review. And uh, so let's take a media, let's, let's look at a media clip here and we're going to see, um, where are you here? Um, yes, that's, that's what I want. Okay. So let me see. I, I didn't rename some things. That's okay. All right. So let's take a look and see what the news media has said. I'm going to play something else just to kind of underline why Colorado is such a problem. So here we go. Oh, you know what? I didn't. Yeah. No, I think, I think it'd be fine. 
insurance for gun owners okay maybe not considered at the state capitol the democratic Let's bill give me a second tonight here. passing out of a house committee it was everyone's collect board lawn live outside the capitol and there talk to both sides of uh people on this bill and collette it just narrowly passed tonight Guys, it was a six to five vote out of committee for House Bill 1270. If it became law, it would require gun owners to ensure their firearms, that coverage already available through home or renter's insurance policies. Now, sponsors of the bill say it will help protect people when accidental shootings happen. Claims could be filed for medical expenses or monetary damages. Hmm. Policyholders would be protected from the claims if their gun was stolen and they report it. Those in support of the bill compared it to car insurance and say it'll increase responsible gun ownership here in Colorado. But those against it say it's one more financial challenge to owning a gun. We know that for existing policies, it it's only about $50. Oh. And so there are protections for folks that can't afford it, but are responsible gun owners and that they, they, they have proven that. Um, and so we've created avenues to make sure that again, we are not impeding on anyone's constitutional rights but making sure that we are um, creating guardrails for responsible gun ownership. I think this is a long, large-scale plan of all this stuff coming together in one way or another to keep firearm owners from wanting to or even legally being able to obtain and own firearms. That was Representative Ryan Armagost. He's also concerned people wouldn't follow this law if it did become law. Now, a first violation would cost a minimum of $500. The next step for House Bill 1270 is the Committee of the Whole. Live outside the Capitol, Club Portal on Denver 7. All right. So there's a rundown of the bill. Basically, what the bill does is it's going to require citizens in Colorado to have firearm insurance. And when you compare it to car insurance, you know, we're so used to car insurance. A lot of people might say, well, that doesn't sound like a bad idea. Like, what happens if you make a mistake well unlike other insurances you know there isn't a an amendment that explicitly states you have a right to fire uh, i'm sorry to automobiles or to a home right whereas there is an actual amendment that says you have a right to have a gun and so then we have to start looking and saying what kind of impediments are you putting in place that will obstruct me from exercising that right. And they make it sound really nice to like, oh, it's only $50. And, but here's the thing, $50 here, $50 there. This stuff adds up, right? Like go to the grocery store and start buying stuff and just buy stuff that's not on sale, right? And you might say, well, this one item, I'll, I'll, I'll buy these Cheetos, they're only $4. And then I'll, I'll just buy this. You know, this soda, it's only however much dollars. I don't know how much soda costs, right? But you start, eventually you get to the, you, you get to the register and you have $150 worth of groceries and it doesn't take long because small things add up and people have expenses and bills that add up. You add, you know, $50 for the insurance. And that's, that's presuming that a, that's even what it costs. And then B, that it will remain at that cost. And it's always possible that later they could put in legislation and say, okay, well, you have to provide, you know, they could tell the insurance companies, you have to provide this level of insurance. And they do that with health insurance already. They already tell people, uh, the insurance companies things that, that are, are a minimum. And people seek out additional legislation saying, well, I think insurers must cover this well every time you add in something new that the insurance company must cover or anything that any requirement upon the insurance company that will inevitably raise the rates of people so sure maybe today it's only 50 dollars, but it could be a hundred or 150 dollars later and it doesn't take long to get there because these costs add up but regardless Regardless, and we're going to go through the bill. I'm going to talk about it because here on the Liberty Dad show, we don't like, it would be easy for me and lazy to just say Second Amendment, you can't infringe upon it, right? Like that would be easy. However, 
we do things better here. We're going to go through the bill. We're going to talk about it. And we're going to talk about why it's actually not a good bill and why voters in Colorado should reject it. And honestly, in my opinion, they should probably remove the people that have forwarded this bill in the first place. But that's we'll, we'll, we'll get to all of that. Before we get to that, I want to play another clip because I started out by saying, Colorado, you have a problem, you know, kind of pinging off the whole Houston, you have a problem or Houston, we have a problem, right? There are, this is actually not the first bill that, that, that will put an impediment into place for gun owners in Colorado. So you may be familiar with Colian Noir. He is a second amendment lawyer, gun rights activist, very sharp fellow. Why during my research, I found this video clip of him. And so we're going to play it and make sure that I sent the right one. Let me see here. Give me just a second. Let me double check and make sure that I got my setup correctly. So I'm not playing the wrong thing. Um, yes, that's, I think that's it. Yes. Okay, perfect. So let's play this and let's hope that it comes on the screen. Um, what the hell is Colorado doing? Why? Give me a second here. Colorado is trying to punish gun owners for the acts of criminals by trying to pass a gun bill that will force gun owners to pay for the acts of criminals. The bill is HB 241349. And what it does is creates 11% excise tax on the sale of all firearms, firearm accessories, and ammunition in the state. If passed, the tax will be on the ballot this fall. Firearms and ammunition are already subject to 11% federal excise tax through the Pittman-Robertson Act, along with a variety of other state and local taxes and fees. To no one's surprise, though, California did this exact same thing already. And I did a video about it where I said this. Who do they think this is going to hurt? Because it's not going to hurt the criminals. It's not going to hurt the rich and the wealthy. It's going to hurt the poor. It's going to hurt the people in the middle. It's going to hurt the people who don't make that much money. Do you know what a 20% tax on a firearm does to people's ability to buy a firearm? It's insane. So if I buy a gun for $500 and I have a 20% tax, I'm looking at $200. I'm looking at an additional $100 on a $500 gun. That's crazy. They're literally pricing people out of the Second Amendment. How is that not a ban? How? How is that not a constructive ban? You're making guns so expensive that people can't afford to buy them while being able to say on paper, you have a second amendment, right? What happened to the reasonableness? What is reasonable about charging people 20% tax on a firearm that they buy to protect their life? There's also a second bill that they're trying to pass, which is HB 241348, which mandates that firearms stored in unattended vehicles must be kept in a locked hard sided container that is kept out of view or within the locked trunk of the vehicle. Look, I get that the idea behind this bill is to make it harder for people to have their guns stolen from the cars, but you don't have to mandate the action. I don't think anyone wants to have their guns stolen. And I have a hard time believing people are just leaving guns sitting on the seat of their car when they're not in the car. But I don't know. Maybe I overestimate people's intelligence in this country. That said, most people throw their guns into the glove boxes or the center console of their vehicle which I get isn't the most secure, but having it in a hard-sided container that can simply be picked up and taken away isn't any more secure either, which is why I... Okay, so I'm going to pause it here and kind of scroll past. He's just got an advertisement for something and we don't really need to play the advertisement, but you get the point here. So he is uh, he's criticizing these other two bills that came out of Colorado and one of them puts a 20% tax uh, basically, it has a tw uh, it totals a twenty percent tax on purchasing a firearm, and then the other one has requirements on how a gun may be stored in your vehicle. So yes, Colorado has a problem because Colorado, you guys keep coming up with all these bills, and like I said, one bill by itself alone may not seem like a big deal, but then you start adding all these other bills. And now you have this huge hurdle for people to climb, as Colian said, to protect yourself. This is a basic right. The right to defend yourself and your family is a basic and fundamental right. And Colorado and many other states as well, they keep coming up with measures to make it just a little bit harder, just a little bit harder, just a little bit harder, all under the guise of safety, protection for the betterment of society, whatever argument they come up with, 
But ultimately, when you look at them all together, they all amount to getting you to that big, huge grocery bill, right? Like the analogy that I just made a moment ago, where a little bit here, a little bit here, no one single purchase is going to be that necessarily that critical purchase. No one bill, at least some of these bills, most of them, seem to be that one tipping point that's just going to cause most people to not be able to get a firearm. But together, they start weeding people out and saying, okay, well, they're making it too difficult for you to get a firearm. So let's continue with Mr. Noir here. Money, money, follow the money. You see, the bill specifies that the first $45 million in the first fiscal year and that amount is adjusted for inflation or deflation in each fiscal year thereafter must be transferred to the Colorado Crime Victim Service Fund in the Division of Criminal Justice of the Department of Public Safety for Crime Victim Service Grants. Now the state wants to give more support to those victims by setting up a fund for them. The Attorney General's office will start that fund with a million dollars. The fund will make sure those victims have support for years to come, something the former principal of Columbine High School says is an important lesson he's learned in the past 20 years. The fund will only be for mass casualties caused by criminal activities, not any natural disasters. I don't have a problem with having a fund for victims of crime. However, I do have a problem with forcing gun owners who don't commit crimes to pay for crimes they didn't commit with exorbitant taxes because it's not just an 11% tax. The Pittman-Robertson Wildlife Restoration Act also places an 11% tax on firearms and ammunition. So that's a 22% tax in total, which is wild. No pun intended. Let's just call a spade a spade. They're financially punishing Americans for exercising a constitutional right. So what do you think? Is it fair to charge 11% tax on guns, ammo, and gun parts to subsidize criminality? And do you think people should be mandated to lock their guns up while they're in their car and attend it? Let me know in the comment section and don't forget to like, share, and subscribe to the channel. And right. if you want to see the okay. current... So uh, like and share and subscribe to my channel, but after his, okay? So yeah, I, this is this is a huge problem, right? What, what he's describing is indeed something that we need to address. And what we're going to do today is like those were two other bills. So now we're going to now we're going to get back to the bill in question here, which is what is it? What number was it? HB. I got it here. Give me just a second. It's HB 241270. So let's take a look at the bill. It's eight pages. So on the surface, an eight page bill, eh, not so bad, right? Like, you know, one of the first things that I look at is how long is the bill? If it's like a 50 page bill. Then I start wondering, I'm like, what is going on here? Like, like, what is it that's so that you need to do that's, you know, that, that, that requires 50 pages or whatever, right? So eight pages, not a bad start, but that's just, the, that's just scratching the surface. So let's pull that bill up and we're going to talk about, we're going to walk through it really quickly and we're going to address a few things. So let's see, where do we go here? All right, perfect. There is the bill up on the screen. I'll read it for anybody that's listening to the podcast. Don't worry. Uh, we're not going to leave anybody out here. So a bill for an act concerning requirement that firearm owners maintain liability insurance and in connection therewith requiring insurance insurers to make coverage available in homeowners and renters insurance policies for damages resulting from accidental or unintentional discharge of a firearm. So basically, that's what it does. They're going to say. You, if you, you, if you're a homeowner or you're a renter, you have to, in your homeowner or renter insurance, you have to have firearm insurance if you own a firearm. And then they're further telling insurers, hey, you have to provide for this. Uh, now, I think this is problematic uh, for a number of reasons because what people don't realize is that insurance, or maybe they do, but let's just reiterate it. Insurance companies what they do is they go out and they get actuaries and they have like a team of people that identify risk and they they work to determine if we're going to offer this policy under what circumstances will we not go broke right like that's basically what they're doing and so they're gonna and right now it's probably i, I assume it's probably pretty easy to offer a policy for fifty dollars like the representative said, because so few people have it. But once you mandate that everybody that has a firearm must have it, and you mandate that the insurance company have it, well, now they have to insure 
for a larger group of people. So therefore, since they have, they have, they might have to pay for more people. They will raise the rates. So it's unlikely to stay at $50 as the representative tried to say. All right. So let's go through here. Um, let's read this. You did. You found a string. The bill requires firearm owners to maintain a liability insurance policy that covers losses or damages to a person other than the policy holder who is injured on the insured property as a result of accidental or unintentional discharge of the firearm. Failure to maintain a firearm liability insurance policy is a civil infraction. A first offense is punishable by a minimum of $500 fine, half of which may be suspended if the person has obtained firearm liability insurance. A second offense within five years of a prior offense is punishable by a minimum $1,000 fine. The bill permits a person who was denied firearm liability insurance by two or more insurers or a person who is indigent and cannot afford the insurance to petition a court for an order declaring that the person is excused from the firearm liability insurance requirement. The court shall issue the order if it finds that the person is likely to behave prudently and safely in the storage, carrying, and use of a firearm that the person has a gun safe or other secure container to store the firearm. The requirement to maintain firearm liability insurance does not apply to a person who holds a valid court order declaring the person is excused from the requirement. So, again, just like Colian pointed out, he said this is the tax on the poor, right? Same thing here. So imagine that you're a poor person. You scrape together. You live in a bad part of town in, 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 in any city in Colorado. You decide that you want to carry a firearm for self-defense so that you can go to and from work safely and maybe – sleep a little bit easier at night. So you go and buy a firearm. Well, now they're saying, well, you've got to get insurance. So what is the likelihood that their insurance in the bad part of town is going to be as cheap as the insurance as somebody who lives in a good part of town where there is less crime? Probably not so much. So now they're going to, now they're going to have to, in order to legally carry, they have to go and get permission to not have insurance and if they can't get permission then they are now carrying illegally so this is a huge tax on poor people um and and and, and i want you to think about this i want you to imagine that you're just trying to defend your family and you have to go and beg the court you have to go and beg the court you all right there okay you have to go beg the court to give you permission to not have this requirement that they put into place. Well, guess what? That takes time. That takes money. Do you have that? This is absolutely like, I know that the representative made it out like, oh, well, we've got provisions in there. Yeah, you've got provisions that make it harder for people because they have to go through and they have to go through all of these steps. But if you're wealthy, well, you don't have to worry about all those steps because you can just pay the insurance, right? Like no big deal. Like, oh, I'll just pay the insurance. So this is already a problem. The bill requires um, an insurer to make available to an applicant the opportunity to include in a homeowner's or renter's insurance policy coverage that satisfies the firearm liability insurance requirement. An insurer may deny firearm liability coverage to an applicant based on the insurer's individualized assessment of the risk related to covering the applicant. So this is another problem. Right. This bill is going to require the insurers uh, offer it, but it doesn't make any requirement on the cost. It doesn't make any requirement as far as, um, you know, what the stipulations are, what the kind of things that they're going to look at. Does it, it doesn't make these kind of requirements. So all of this is kind of up in the air. So let's get to the part here. Now, we're not going to read the whole bill because what you've read, what we've read, what we've talked about you basically have a good summary of the bill, but there's a couple of points that I want to attack. And that's here in this legislative declaration. Now, remember, if you've watched my show for a while now, you know that I, I, I think that when you read all like the whereas clauses and whatever declarations that they have, those are important because they set the tone for why a bill is necessary. And the big thing for me is when somebody says, here is a bill, we should pass it. The first question I ask is why? What is the evidence that supports a need for this particular bill? 
And in most cases, because of because I'm a libertarian, I look and I say, I don't think we actually need that. And part of it is because when we go look at whatever is alleged to be the need, we often find that it's not really it, it's it, it doesn't measure up like you might expect. So let's take a look. Beginning in the 1830s, U.S. jurisdictions enacted charity laws that required certain firearm owners to post a surety bond that would be forfeited if the firearm owner failed to keep the peace. Historical surety laws did not prohibit anyone from, from possessing or carrying firearms, but incentivized responsible firearm possession by requiring a surety that the owner would forfeit in the event that the owner breached the peace. At least 10 U.S. jurisdictions enacted similar, if not identical, surety laws during the 19th century, and the historical surety laws are analogous to modern liability insurance that does not prohibit firearm ownership or use. Now, you might remember a few episodes back where I reviewed the case up in Illinois where the illegal immigrant had pushed back and said, hey, I, I have the right to the Second Amendment. And a lot of people got really angry about that. And they're like, oh, I can't believe this. It was the Obama appointed judge that made this ruling. And they were like flipping out. And I said, hey, you know, this is a good thing and it can be used to our benefit, to the benefit of Second Amendment um, uh, people who v value the Second Amendment. Well, that case somewhat comes into play, at least in our thinking. I don't know about legally, because remember, folks, I am not a lawyer. I'm just simply reading and interpreting what I read. That's it. I'm just making a, a judgment call based on what I've read. So just to review that, what I had said in the past was government, uh, our laws are based on precedent. And in that particular case, what ended up happening is the judge went back and said, OK, in this Supreme Court case, uh, there is this test. There's this historical test. And what you have to do is you have to go back and you have to say, OK, in order to understand how people of the time understood the Constitution and your rights, let's go back and look at the things that they argued about, you know, the debates that they had and the laws that they passed. And if there are laws that they passed that are similar to laws that we might want to pass today, then there's a good chance that it passes constitutional muster. In other words, if we're doing something similar to back then, when the words were written early on and people understood, like we look at it today and there's a lot of arguments over the Second Amendment. I don't think there's arguments, but people like to make arguments. They'll say like, well, you know, it says militia, blah, blah. And if you go back and you look, you find that. How they understood militia at the time is not how opponents of the Second Amendment understand militia. It's entirely different. And so their argument doesn't make sense because it doesn't fit with how people understood it when, uh, when they were close to when it was written, which is going to be the best understanding of the Second Amendment that you can find. Right? We can interpret it all we want today, you know, 100 plus years later, but if you go back early on, and you look at how they applied it then, that's going to be your best understanding of what it meant and what people understood it meant. So this is a good test. So what they're saying here now is they're saying, well, in the 1830s, there were surety laws. And these surety laws required that a firearm owner posted a surety bond that they would forfeit if they didn't keep the peace. And here's the interesting part. It says, historical surety laws did not prohibit anyone from possessing or carrying firearms, but incentivized responsible firearm possession by requiring a surety that the owner would forfeit in the event that the owner breached the peace. This is actually not quite accurate. So let's take a look. Let's go find if we can, let's go see if we can find where it is accurate. And as it turns out, there's a Supreme Court case that we can look at. So let me put that up on the screen, and then we will take a look at this case. All right, so this case here, flip back to my, uh, there we go. This is the National Rifle, uh, I'm sorry, the New York State Rifle and Pistol Association uh, versus Bruin in New York. And so what's going on here? Well, let's, well, I mean, it's, it's a hundred and this, this one is what, how many pages? This is 135 pages. We're clearly not going to read it all, but we can skip to a few things that talk about the surety laws. So let's go down here. 
And I want to make sure that everybody can read this. Is it big enough? Oh, yes, that's big enough, I guess. Um, okay, so surety statutes. In the mid-19th century, many jurisdictions began adopting laws that required certain individuals to post bond before carrying weapons in public. Okay, sounds like sounds like they're correct. Um, contrary to, res to respondent's position, these surety statutes in no way represented direct precursors to New York's proper cause requirement. Now, they're actually addressing something that's different. So New York had, uh, uh, New York was trying to impose something different. This is, so, so they, and they tried to also rely on the, uh, the notion of surety laws. We're not going to talk about uh, the New York case, although it was rejected, um, rightfully so. And you can go and read it on your own. We're just going to talk about what they had to say about the surety laws here in this case, and then see if they match the bill that was, uh, that, that is being forwarded by the, okay. I don't know why it's okay. Anyway, um, how about that? All right. So am I going to work? I don't know. Anyway, I was trying to figure out where, where I am in relation to the, sorry, I'm playing around on my screen here. So, uh, let me get back to what I'm supposed to be doing here. So anyway, so what, what we're going to do is we're going to read, uh, about what they said about the surety laws and see if it matches up with this bill in Colorado. Okay. So while New York presumes that individuals have no public carry right without a showing of heightened need, the surety statutes presumed that individuals had a right to public carry that could be burdened only if another could make out a specific showing of quote, reasonable cause to fear an injury or breach of the peace. Now, I hope you understood what that means. So let me let me read again. Historical surety laws did not prohibit anyone from possessing or carrying firearms, but incentivized responsible firearm possession by requiring a surety that the owner would forfeit in the event that the owner breached the peace. And they further went and said, in the 1830s, U.S. jurisdiction enacted surety laws that required certain firearm owners to post a surety bond that would be forfeited if the firearm owner failed to keep the peace. So they're kind of right, but they're leaving out a very important dis, uh, issue. And that is that it could, they could, that the individuals had a right to public carry. So they were allowed to carry publicly openly, but it could be burdened only if another person could make out a specific showing of reasonable cause to fear an injury or breach of the peace. In other words, in 1830, when they passed the surety laws, when you start seeing these surety laws pop up, the, someone would say, I think I heard DL talking about he's going to carry around his gun and scare all the black folk. Let's just say it that way, right? And so then they might make a charge and accusation against me. And then we both have to go before the court. And the court has to decide whether or not this actually was true. Like, is there any, am I maybe trying to carry in a way that's going to be intimidating to black people, right? Or any person for that matter. And if so, if it could be shown that maybe I was going to do that, they might say, okay, well, DL, to ensure that you don't do this, give us a hundred dollars. And you lose that $100 if you actually do what this person says you're going to do. So this was, this was in response to a potential charge of somebody doing something wrong. It wasn't just off the cuff like, oh, well, you know what? To, to help people be more responsible, we're going to pass these surety. No, that's not what it was. And that's exactly what this bill says. This bill says, they did not prohibit anyone from possessing or carrying firearms, but incentivized responsible firearm possession by requiring a surety that the owner would forfeit in the event that the owner breached the peace. That wasn't the pot that that wasn't it wasn't to incentivize this general, broad, responsible firearm possession, which is how it is written here. That's not what it was doing. It was on an individual case by case basis. Are you a person that might be making threats or disturbing the peace? And if you are, you can still carry, but you got to put up some funds that you're going to lose if you disturb the peace. 
So let's continue on with what else the Supreme Court had to say here. Um, let's see, let's see, uh, page 48. So we're, gonna, so we're on page five. We're going to jump down to page 48 here. Um, here's what they said. Only, only after the ratification of the Second Amendment in 1791 did public carry restrictions proliferate. Respondents rely heavily on these restrictions, which generally fell into three categories, common law offenses, statutory prohibitions, and surety statutes. None of these restrictions imposed a substantial burden on public carry analogous to the burden created by New York's restrictive licensing regime. So New York was trying to make a restrictive uh, licensing uh, law, and it was challenged and said, hey, look, um, you're saying that, that, that you're doing this because surety laws kind of are similar, but we're saying they're not, right? So, so they got rejected, this New York licensing. Uh, so let's continue on to the next item here. Let's see here, page 53. All right, surety statutes. Let me read this. And it's going to be a, a little bit, we're, we're, I've got some highlighted, but I'm going to read a little bit more than that. Surety statutes. In the mid to nine, in the mid 19th century, many jurisdictions began adopting surety statutes that required certain individuals to post bond before carrying weapons in public. Although respondents seize on these laws to justify the proper cause restriction, their reliance on them is misplaced. These laws were not bans on public carry, and they typically targeted only those threatening to do harm. As discussed earlier, Massachusetts had prohibited riding or going, quote, armed offensively to the fear or terror of the good citizens of this commonwealth, end quote since 1795 1795 massachusetts acts and laws in laws of the commonwealth of massachusetts in 1836 massachusetts enacted a new law providing quote if any person shall go armed with a dirk dagger sword pistol or other offensive and dangerous weapon without reasonable cause to fear an assault or other injury or violence to his person or to his family or property he may on complaint of any person having reasonable cause to fear an injury or breach of the peace be required to find sureties for keeping the peace for a term not exceeding six months with the right of appealing as before provided. So I want you to pay attention to what I just said. Number one, again, I'm going to repeat this. The surety laws were based only after a complaint. And the complaint had to be reasonable. If somebody said in, in 17 in 1836, if somebody had said, I think that DL is going to go out and cause a riot with his firearm, with his open carry, the government would say, DL, let's have a conversation. And I would, I would be permitted the right to appeal and say, that's totally not true. Fred over here is making it up. It there's he's he's just mad at me because I wouldn't loan him some sugar and I slept with his wife, whatever. Right. Like and, and I could make my appeal and say, no, he's totally incorrect. This is not true. And so then the court might look and say, turns out they could look at it and go one of two ways. Right. They could say, well, it turns out Fred's correct. Based on the evidence, we believe that DL might be looking to go and stir up some trouble. So, DL, you need to find sureties. Um, uh, you, you're required now these sureties and you got six months, right? And then we can, we, we can reevaluate it again after that. If we still believe that there's another threat, but this only lasts for six months or the alternative is I could demonstrate that Fred was absolutely lying and he's just mad at me because, you know, for whatever reason that we're in a, we're in a squabble. And then the court might say, well, Fred, it looks like you haven't proven that DL is actually going to do any of this stuff that you claim he's going to do. So therefore no sureties are necessary period. Right. That's how it plays out. This is the law that they're trying to reference and they're trying to make it out as if the surety laws were just something that was put out there for, uh, for broadly that people had to follow. Now let's continue on in short, the Commonwealth required any person who was reasonably likely to breach the peace and who's standing accused could not prove a special need for self-defense to post a bond before public carrying a firearm. Okay, so again, you had these stipulations that had to be put into place. Between 1838 and 1871, nine other jurisdictions adopted 
variants of the Massachusetts law. Contrary to respondents' position, these reasonable laws in no way represented the direct precursor to the proper cause requirement. Okay, so now we're getting into the specific case here. Okay, so again, there were stipulations on these surety laws, but in this particular case, with the um, uh, with with with, let um, me put it back up on the screen here. Uh, where do we go here? There we are. So in this particular case, in Colorado's law, what they're trying to do is just use this reference to surety laws to make a broad-based law that applies to everybody, regardless of whether or not somebody's a threat. So it's based on a false understanding, uh, an incorrect understanding, a historical inaccuracy. That's what it's based on. And so let me bring this back to that Illinois issue with the immigrant. Right. So the test was what was understood of the day? Is it analogous to today? Well, it's not analogous to today because in this particular case, they want it to cover everybody, enforce everybody, whether they've been accused of potentially disturbing the peace or not. They want to apply it to everyone. And then they want to make it that it's a penalty if you don't do this. Whereas Historically, what the surety laws did, they said, okay, well, you can you can continue to carry, but we're going to take some money for six months, and you'll get it back if you don't breach the peace, right? So that was the incentive. It was entirely different. It wasn't a requirement to do business with somebody else, which is what insurance companies are, right? That's a business. It wasn't a requirement that they had to provide a service. Uh, in, or, or a product. It wasn't the requirement that I had to purchase it. There is nothing analogous about this bill. All right. So let's go on here. Now, let's see. The historical surety laws are analogous to modern liability insurance that does not prohibit firearm or ownership or use. That is absolutely incorrect. Now, let's, let's go back to something up here. Where was it here? Um, I should have highlighted and I, sh I sure didn't. Let's see here. Give me a second. Do, 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 uh, where did it go? Um, oh, I lost it. I should have highlighted. I did not think to highlight it. I know what I want to find. Um, it's maybe up here. So, okay, this will be good enough. We'll do it this way. Okay, so look at the very beginning here. Concerning a requirement that firearm owners maintain liability insurance and in connection there, uh, there with requiring insurers to make coverage available in homeowner and renter insurance policies for damages resulting from accidental or unintentional discharge or fire. So the purpose of this is to deal with an accidental or unintentional, I'm going to highlight it right now so we don't lose it. So the purpose of this bill is to address accidental or unintentional firearm discharge. At the very beginning of this show, I said, when we look at a bill, we have to first look at, is there even a need, right? And according to the, the people that are pushing the bill, this is going to help make a, a more safe Colorado, okay? But there, this bill addresses, again, accidental or unintentional discharge of a firearm. So if I accidentally shoot you know, somebody in the arm, there's liability insurance, right? By, um, okay, so let's, let's see. Let's see what the need for that is. A lot of people like to argue about statistics, and I found one of the best ways to argue back is to use statistics that they won't argue with. So that's exactly what I'm going to do. So you might be familiar with... Um, what the hell is Colorado whoa, doing? Hold on. Hi, Colorado. Colorado is trying to punish gun... There we go. Sorry about that. Had two things queued up at the same time. So this comes from the website, Everytown USA. They are viciously anti-gun, okay? So they are not at all Second Amendment in my mind. Um, and this is some of their own statistics. You can go to everystat.org. This is Everytown USA. They publish like a, like virtually any any studies or any any data that you see that's against the Second Amendment probably came from there. I, I see so many of them and when I hunt it down, turns out it comes from every town. So they've got a nice little map of all the states. 
And then you can click on the different states here. Well, we have Colorado pulled up. And over here, it says filter by. And we can, we can get a filter. And it's got all gun deaths, suicides, homicides, shooting by police, unintentional, undetermined. Okay, cool. So, and it says under, when we filter it by all gun deaths, in an average year, 930 people die by guns with a rate of 15.6 deaths per 100,000 people. Colorado has the 22nd highest rate of gun deaths in the U.S. Now, it sounds like that might be a lot, like 930 people, okay? And it depends on how you want to look at the statistics. You can look at them raw. You can look at them per 100,000. There's any number of ways to slice and dice it. But let's just go with it. It's fine, 930. So let's click over here on unintentional because that's what this bill addresses, right? Unintentional, accidental, right? It's not addressing suicides. It's not a, suicides uh, out of the 930, 677 of them are suicides. So two thirds of all the gun deaths uh, on average in Colorado are suicides, two thirds. And now they're not, this bill doesn't address that. It doesn't address how to deal with suicides, okay? It addresses unintentional. And then if we go down to homicides and shooting by police, well, that's 240, again, out of 930. So you're looking at about a quarter, right? So about a quarter of them. And then we get down to unintentional. So this is interesting. The average number of deaths of unintentional intent in this state is fewer than 10. 10. And is therefore suppressed by the CDC. The CDC said it's so low, it's not even it's not even worth putting our effort into it to put out this information. We're just going to suppress it and just call it tiny or however they re reference it, right? With a rate of 0.1 deaths per 100,000 people. So you have three representatives right now who are advancing this bill. And they're just sure that this is a good bill because it follows surety laws, which it doesn't. It's only $50, which they can't guarantee in, perpetu in perpetuity. And it's going to, and it's going to make Colorado a safer place with more responsible gun owners by dealing with an average of under 10 deaths annually. That's what this bill is going to do. In other words, this bill isn't going to do anything. It's performance. And I found all of this in a couple of hours. I did a couple of hours of research, did some reading. I actually found more information, but I was like, all right, you know, I don't really need any more. Like this says it all. And the, again, these statistics here, this data, is coming from an anti-gun organization. They are not pro 2A. They are not massaging the data in any way to make the Second Amendment more appealing to the public. They, they probably are doing the opposite, right? Like this, this, this data, I mean, I assume that they went, when they report specific numbers, they're reporting them accurately. But if you've seen any of my previous epi episodes where I'm criticizing how data is diced and sliced and whatnot. Uh, that's not always the case, but let's just assume a good faith here, right? Like, okay, you're anti-gun. They would like to have more gun control. So let's take a look. And we find out that fewer than 10 deaths annually, and that's the need for this bill, right? No, they're not going to address the suicides. I mean, they might, right? They, they might be addressing, they might be trying to address that, but I don't think so. They're not, I mean, this bill won't address suicides because a suicide is not accidental. It's not unintentional. It's very intentional. So they're not addressing the two-thirds of the gun deaths. Two-thirds. Because remember, 677 versus 930. That's two-thirds. Two-thirds of the – all of the every, – every bill that somebody in the Colorado legislature should be pushing, every bill should have to do with how can we reduce suicides? If they actually care about gun deaths, they will tackle suicides. They'll, I mean, if they were to, if they were to make 
I'm trying to think of some numbers off the top of my head. Um, so it's two thirds of the of all gun deaths. Let's say they were to cut that in half. They go from 600 something to 300 something. And now it's not two thirds, it's one third, which actually the it, okay, so that that's not really going to work because if we drop, then it's no longer going to be one third of everything unless all the other numbers stay the same. So, uh, but presumably other numbers would change or whatever. But at any rate, they would drop it by half, right? And but no, they're going after 10, less than 10. This is not a good bill. There's nothing good about this. They're requiring you to do business with another person. They're requiring another person to offer a product that they may not want to offer. They're going to re require you to carry it. You're going to have to have it on you to prove it. Otherwise, you're going to have to get into the legal system. That's why I titled this Your Papers, Please. Because if an officer right now, um, at best, I need to carry uh, my... Um, uh, the, the card that I have, my my concealed carry card, right? I carry my concealed carry card and I show that to the officer. That That's at best, right? And that's that's still a, your papers, please, uh, situation. But an officer at any time could simply be like, well, show me your homeowner's insurance. Who the hell carries their homeowner's insurance or their renter's insurance with them? But now they're going to have to if this bill passes. So people in Colorado, you need to do something about your legislature. I recommend tossing them out physically if you have to, but you don't, you don't have to. I'm just saying like, it's on the table though, right? It's like on the table to throw them out physically. Uh, luckily you have other options, but they should know when you talk to them, you should, you should be like, look, we're going to toss you out on your butt physically if we have to, but we're going to do it nicely and we're just going to vote you out. Because you suck. You're, present, you're presenting bills based on mistruth. You know, there's all this conversation about uh, misinformation. This whole bill is filled with mis misinformation. It's total misinformation. That's not how surety laws worked. And they're trying to make something out of something that didn't, you know, that, that existed entirely differently. They're trying to impose on good people who have shown uh, who nobody has shown that they're going to be dangerous. They're just going to say, well, you have a firearm, you must be potentially dangerous. So, so therefore, you need to carry this insurance. As opposed to the original surety laws, which said somebody made a complaint about you and said, I think this guy is going to go in and disturb the peace. And then it had to be kind of proven. Now, what I didn't get into, there were some other articles uh, and and. One of them was an amicus brief that was sent in for that same Supreme Court, and it was written by a, 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 a Second Amendment lawyer with um, – I can't remember which college it is at the moment, <clears throat> but I, I skimmed through it. And part of his argument was these laws, these surety laws, were never actually enforced. So they got put on the books, but they didn't really – like nobody really cared much about them. And then he further goes to say that – they put the laws on the books, but there was no debate about them. So it's unclear whether people even actually agreed at the time that these surety laws would have passed constitutional muster. In other words, they just created a law. It never got enforced. Nobody really had any arguments for it or against it. Nobody seemed to care. They just kind of did it and it was there. And so it didn't even survive a constitutional challenge back then because had it survived a constitutional challenge then then it would make more precedent for today for someone to say well maybe we should go back to these surety laws because we once upon a time had them and that's how people understood uh, the constitution to read but that's not even the case so you know depending on how deep you want to dig into this it just gets worse and worse trying to use the surety laws as an analog today. Um, and then second of all, uh, and this is, I think this is huge. You didn't have to pay somebody on a recurring basis for uh, insurance. You had a six month limit, or maybe it might've varied from the various uh, jurisdictions that utilizes, but you had 
um, a time limit on this. Hey, and, you know, we just read it. We read from the Massachusetts statute. It put a time limit of a six months, six month time limit. But the bill in Colorado, they're like, well, this is in perpetuity. If you own a firearm, you have insurance and that's it. And it's only $50, even though they can't guarantee that. So it's an underhanded way of limiting your second amendment. And when you look at some of the other laws, as Coley and Noir pointed out, Colorado has a problem. So Colorado citizens, you need to get your act together and you need to start raising your voice and rejecting these bills. And then I would look, I'm a big fan of kicking people out of office. And I don't think it takes much because why? Well, when we start seeing somebody who's in office putting forward these lazy bills, these, in, these historically inaccurate bills, bills that are effectively filled with misinformation, that tells me one of two things. They're either deceitful or they're ignorant. And I don't want either one of them trying to make laws. So they need to be removed. And the quicker that you remove them, the bigger, uh, the, the more likely that sends a signal to the rest of them, get your act together. If you're going to present a law and you're going to use history as a basis for your law, you better have it correct. You better not be outdone by some dad as a podcaster in Florida who picked up, you know, that you had this bill and spent all of two hours researching it in two hours. I mean, I didn't spend much time. I might've been maybe two and a half at most, but two, two and a half hours I spent. And I figured out very quickly that this bill is not what it says it is. It doesn't reflect history accurately. And uh, we have Supreme Court cases, uh, Supreme Court rulings that say so. So I'm not, it's not like I just went to Wikipedia, you know, and said, oh, well, it looks like Wikipedia says no. So therefore, bad idea. Nope, I didn't do that. I went to original source material. I'm a podcasting guy in, in Florida. And if your legislators can't outdo me, if they can't do any better, get rid of them. Get rid of them. All right, folks, that was my show today. Let's look at some comments here. Uh, Brian says, do you think the recent judgment in Mich uh, Michigan about the parents of a mass shooter of manslaughter is along these lines? They each received 10 to 15 years for their son committing the crime with the gun. Um, I vaguely remember that. I know I kind of looked over it briefly. I didn't look too detailed into that particular case. Uh, my initial assessment was to agree with it. However, uh, the details may change my mind. The, the issue that I had with it was my understanding. They knew that there was an issue with their son, like had some mental health issues or something like that. And they let it go. And I think there was, um, there was a situation where, um, I think that's the one where they, they were at work. And they got called by the school and the school said, Hey, we have a problem. And they said, no, he's fine or something like that. And then they let him go back to school or, or what have you. And then after that, the shooting broke out or something, something along that line. Uh, my memory is a little bit hazy at the moment on that particular story, but from what I was able to read and I did not look at source material at the time. So I wasn't looking at like actual court documents or things that, you know, have been kind of rigorous, rigorously verified. Um, but my, my understanding was that in this particular case, there was an opportunity for parents to be mindful of their son and they chose not to, and not that they chose and said, okay, well, he's probably not going to go and shoot a bunch of people with this gun. It was more like, Hey, we've got this mental health claim here. We're not pursuing it like we should. And as a dad, I keep you know, I'm very vigilant about my son. Now he's only five, so he's certainly not in any danger of harming other people with any significance, right? However, when he wakes up, I can tell something's off, right? So I look and I just kind of keep an eye on him and his mood so that I can understand, you know, how do I need to approach him today? Is he grumpy? Is he complaining about certain things? Is he being a little bit whiny or is he super duper chipper? And we know he's going to be pretty resilient today emotionally, you know, so I, I keep tabs on that. Now, in fairness, I'm not at the teenage level. So at five years old, 
it's going to be a lot harder for him to disguise than if he was 15 or 16 or 17. So I can't speak to, you know, whether or not that strategy holds as well. But for right now, I'm going to say you should know your child or and spend enough time with your child that it doesn't take you very long to identify when something's wrong and then you can address that. And if other people are making complaints and saying, hey, there's something up with your son, you probably need to take that seriously. So that's kind of where I am with that. Um, I, you know, again, I could be entirely wrong on that. I have not looked at the source material, you know, the the court documents to to really be firm in that particular opinion, but that's how I see it. I don't have a problem necessarily with parents being held liable. I do think that there is a limitation on that. You know, if you've got a 15, 16 year old kid, I don't think you can be liable for everything they do. If they go out and they get in a fight and you don't know anything about it and they harm somebody and put them in the hospital, I don't know that you should necessarily be responsible for that if you had no knowledge of it and no way to, uh, to intervene. But if there was an opportunity for you to intervene and you failed, then there might be, um, you know, th it might be the case that you are responsible for that. And then we get into, you know, what does that mean? What is the outcome? Should they, um, what was it? They went to jail for like 10 to 15 years. Is that what it was? Yeah. They, they received 10 to 15 years for their son committing a crime with a gun. I don't know that 10 to 15 years is necessarily appropriate. Again, that's something I would have to sit down and kind of study and evaluate. Um, I get it. The idea is like, Hey, if it's 10 to 15 years, then you'll be more vigilant, hopefully. But, um, but could you accomplish that with maybe five to 10 years? Right. Could, like, I don't know that 10 to 15 years is totally necessary. So that's my perspective on that one. Ultimately, all of my views are going to come down on people need the maximum freedom possible with the second amendment. And with very, very few exceptions, there's not going to be very many politicians that will agree with me. Most of them are going to disagree with me. You might have like your Thomas Massey's and, you know, a couple of others who are going to be like, yep, I agree with you, DL. But otherwise, most of them are going to disagree with me because I don't want prohibitions in most cases because the data doesn't support it. And then I don't think we're going to get what we think we're going to get, right? Like it's just... We're just passing laws to make ourselves feel better. And ultimately we're harming the people who are not criminals more than actually stopping criminals. And that makes it a useless law in my, my, in my book. So, um, that's where I am on those laws. Thank you everybody for watching. I appreciate your time. I hope you found it informative and inspiring. Be sure to read the bills. When you hear about a bill, go read it. Um, it, I, I cannot stress that enough. You won't, and it, sometimes I, I get it. You can't read all of them. Divide and conquer, right? Like you focus on a particular type of bill. You know, maybe you're into real estate, so keep pay pay attention to real estate bills. Maybe you're a big two A person in your government. I mean, I mean, I know your government in your state, and you need to just stay focused on all the two A bills that are being presented in your state, right? Like you can narrow it down. And if everybody narrowed it down to what was interesting, uh, what was interesting for them, then they could pass this information about. And I think we would have a better society with fewer laws and the laws that we do had would be more robust and worthwhile. Make sure you are subscribed to my YouTube channel, or if you prefer my rumble channel, you can go to youtube.libertydad.com or you can go to rumble.libertydad.com while you're there. Give me a like, give me a subscribe, and leave me a comment. Let me know how I'm doing. I want you to remember, if you are a champion of liberty, your business is people, and your product is liberty. You should have a great week. Catch you next time. For now, I'm out.